to the Humanities Forum. I'm really glad you all could come out this afternoon to join us to watch one of the great debates of the 20th century, which I will introduce briefly, and we'll watch it. Um, and then we'll talk about it, what we saw. So the Humanities Forum, in case this is your first time at one of these things, is an initiative of the Humanities Program at Providence College, which aims to enrich your educational experience, basically, to help you make connections between your other classes, and to get you to think seriously about the major issues in the world, in our culture, in the faith. Uh, this semester, for example, there's one of these almost every Friday with various professors from universities around the country on everything from Apostle Paul to the French Revolution to 21st century medicine. Now, this particular event that I'm hosting today is put on by the Frederick Douglass Project, which is an initiative of the Humanities Program at Providence College, and it aims to cultivate in students the skills of reasoned debate and persuasion necessary for a healthy society. So the idea is, you know, our country is a country that's built on words, right? On persuading people, on getting the consent of the governed. A number of you heard this morning, right? That a, a just government is derives from the consent of the governed, and that requires talk, it requires speech, it requires engaging with each other about how our country should be, about what's right, what's wrong, what's just, what laws we wanna live by. So we're trying to promote that through the project, and we do that through events like this. There will be an essay and debate contest in the spring. We've got some classes. Um, should be good. And I should note that the Douglas Project is made possible by support from the Jack Miller Center, and I'm very grateful to them for their support. Now, today, we have the privilege of watching what I would call a milestone debate of the 20th century, featuring two intellectual heavyweights. James Baldwin, whom you might read in some of your civ classes even this semester, a great uh, essayist and novelist. And on the other hand, William F. Buckley, who was one of the founders of modern conservatism in the United States. They're debating in Cambridge 1965, and the topic is, has the American dream been achieved at the expense of the American Negro? And you could think about that question in a number of different ways, such as, how should we view our nation's history? with its competing legacies of freedom and of slavery? To what extent has American prosperity and growth been bound up with inequality or exploitation? And what exactly does the legacy of slavery have to do with our country today? And these are questions that are with us today, right? Because while maybe none of you were alive in 1965, I'm pretty confident that all of you were alive in 2020, where, you know, you remember it, there were the, the blackout squares on Instagram, there was protests, there was the toppling of statues, including of some of the founders. And, you know, in general, a lot of arguments going back and forth about the, cla the, the claim that the United States was not conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, as Abraham Lincoln famously says, but rather that it was conceived in slavery, in inequality, in exploitation. These are serious charges and they need to be considered and argued seriously, not via sound bites or virtue signaling. So in a minute we'll watch the debate and I'm gonna show the, the beginning part where two English students get up and, and introduce the topic uh, because I think that even though they're not Baldwin or Buckley, it's, it helps us sort of place the debate in a, the historical moment of 1965 and in the conversations that are going on. So they talk for about two or three minutes each and then the main debate is about 48 or 50 minutes. Afterwards, we'll have Q&A with the microphone right back there. And the tradition of the Humanities Forum is that a student always has to step up to ask the first question. So have those wheels turning as you watch and think about like, what do I wanna do to launch this conversation? Uh, three closing observations and then I will be quiet. One is that you'll notice this debate, once it gets rolling, if your only experience of, of public debates was the Trump-Biden debate, you're in for a surprise because these, these speakers both speak in longer than five word sentences. They don't insult each other. And in fact, both Baldwin and Buckley, as you'll see, are people who believed in the kind of like exploring the full studio space of just how far a sentence can stretch. That means you need to be on your toes to listen through to the end of that sentence and figure out what are they saying. So that's one. 
Another is they're not always speaking directly to the question. Sometimes they're, they're um, or necessarily directly to each other. So as you listen, you should think about like, okay, what are the big ideas they're putting forward here? And what are their key claims, key points, key responses to each other? Lastly, I would encourage you not to think in narrow terms of winners and losers of this debate, but rather in terms of what can we take away from it to that merits further discussion and serious consideration. So with that, I'm going to hit the lights and fire up this debate. And there's a couple of minutes of British people clapping that I'll try to skip through. Be mindful of your time. But no, because it's in black and white. All right. So without further ado. So you've heard the two sides. I'd like to hear what observations, questions, responses you have. What stood out to you about this debate? Hello. Uh, yeah, so I think um, the most important point, I think, from James Baldwin was, um, and I don't know if he made this explicit, but it was definitely in there, uh, the question of citizenship for black Americans. Essentially, even the question that was up for debate kind of assumes and insinuates that uh, black Americans are not, in fact, Americans. Uh, if we were to ask, has the American dream been achieved? We have to ask ourselves, who are Americans? Uh, if it has been achieved, if black people are considered Americans, then no, the American dream has not been achieved. But if the only people who qualify for the American dream are white Americans, then the question that was posed was relevant, but again, the question of citizenship. So, yeah. I think an important note about Buckley's speech was the um, the sort of assumption of mobility in American society in um, 1965, um, which I'm unsure of, I, you know, obviously I can't read Buckley's notes, but I'm unsure if this was a rhetorical strategy or not, because at the time, um, there it wasn't really a mobile society. We were coming off of, um, uh, especially for certain citizens in the country or certain people who lived in America. We were coming off of an economic boon, obviously, because of um, World War II, but um, this was sort of a time when we saw a rise of um, certain trends like redlining, especially in real estate. And I'm unsure as to whether Buckley misconstrued America as being a m totally mobile society for people of color or whether this was a sort of rhetorical strategy. But I think that's an important point to note. So here are two you know, initial big fault lines that we could see running through the debate. On the one hand, Baldwin is, as Daniel mentioned, making this case that you, know, you discover at a young age that the, the flag to that you have pledged allegiance to has not pledged allegiance to you, and this feeling of being um, without a country runs up against Buckley's assertion that no, you are in fact a citizen in the land of opportunity, in the, in the place in the world that ha where making something better of yourself is in fact most possible, thus you should double down on this. This is a, a point of debate. Who wants to chime in here? I'll dive in um, and, and maybe build on a point from each of our students. Um, I was intrigued not just at that question of citizenship, but when Baldwin started actually with that question of whether one civilization has a right to subjugate another, right? And I mean, I, I think maybe our instinct is just to say these days, no, of course not. But of course, so much of our history Right is exactly that the patterns of subjugation and fighting. So it's it's just a, a very important thing for us to think about both that question of whether one civilization has a right to subjugate another, 
and how that ties in exactly to how we go forward with some citizens among us being subjugated because of that very history, exactly. So something to think about there. And then the thing I'll add over here, I was intrigued by Buckley's point about um, wanting to raise the standards of citizenship to rule out 65% of the white voters. Um, and I think that's an important question for us to wrestle with, again, regardless of the race issues, to think about what, what the responsibilities of citizenship entail today and how much literacy and education, I mean, I, th I think our instinct is to be, is to have a very low, low bar in the name of inclusiveness. But also, like, w what should we demand of ourselves and one another in terms of being the very best citizens we can be, uh, participating in the democracy that we usually say we want? I was intrigued. I've seen this before, but for all the the things from Buckley, but what really struck struck me is the way he ended, right? Because Baldwin seems, and he sort of he sort of um, anticipates some of the contemporary Kennedy and those kinds of folks, sort of trashing the American ideals as if they don't exist. They're just they're just made up. Right, all men are created equal and such. Um, but he says, well, if you trash them, and there are no actual principles that anyone will adhere to, all you're re really left to is fighting, violence. It's either principle or it's power. And it's kind of interesting because the way I read our contemporary world some of the allegiance to principles, partly because of the work of folks like Baldwin, um, but and, and also the terrible behaviors of of, of uh, uh, parts of American history. It, it's kind of easy to trash the principles, but his point is: if you don't have the principles, if you can't argue in light of the principles of the United States, what are you actually left with? Um, I think we're beginning to see what you're left with. People fighting over the spoils. Uh, so I found that last bit uh, prophetic. I guess I would call into question the extent to which is Baldwin trashing the principles or is he suggesting that that the principles perhaps are are leaned on to obscure, to avoid some sort of direct confrontation with reality. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that um, that Baldwin, I think, really just kind of encourages us to look at our own histories, and I feel that that is, um, you know, important as you know, we study history in DWC and, and in other history classes that um, the best thing we can do to move forward is understand like what um, what was done in the past. And I don't know if that explicitly answers the question, but um, I think the one of the main points of Baldwin is to, from Baldwin, is for us to recognize our history and try and move forward from that. I guess the follow-up question, though, I would have is: Do you th is it possible to fully accept Baldwin's critique of America and still remain patriotic in some sense? Do you, do, do you want me? To, okay, here, let me bring the. Wait, wait, wait! We gotta to record for posterity. Oh, okay. I mean, my point is simply, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to draw the quotes um, readily, but um, I mean, Baldwin considered himself a patriot. I mean, um, he, like I said, I'm not going to be able to draw the quotes, but um, I, I mean, Baldwin himself, he, he, I mean, he lived in France for a long time um, because he didn't, uh, because of the racial situations in the United States, and also because he didn't want to be put in a corner, he didn't want to be put in a box, he didn't want to be seen as only an American black author, he wanted to be um, 
like just an author generally. You didn't want to be um, confined. But um, yeah, I mean, s my point simply, and if I w were to Google them, I could find them, but Baldwin is on the record himself identifying as a patriot. What else? Oh, sorry. The earlier questions, as well as to Dr. Keating's point, I don't think that uh, Baldwin is necessarily trashing American ideals. He's more or less saying that we haven't lived up to them um, as a society. Yeah. What are other things that stood out to you about this debate, or like confused you, or shocked you, or surprised you, or anything like that? Um, I think one thing that was uh, quite interesting about the debate was the question is whether America has served the Negro in the American dream. And for Baldwin and for Buckley, that wasn't so much of a question of whether or not it did or it didn't, but what exactly is the American dream? What does that mean? And to um, point back to the discussion we've been having thus far, I think it really is just a question of what is the American nation, not the country itself, but what that nation means for different people in different sects, not just black and white. But um, there's the point that Buckley makes about restricting voting rights for white Americans even further. I think it's just a, a tumultuous topic in general about whether or not what is the American nation. Everybody has this idea that it's freedom, it's liberty, but freedom and liberty kind of as this debate points, is different for a lot of different people, and we still struggle to find that now. I found the famous quote. It's uh, Baldwin says, I love America more than any other country in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Now, that might sound a little harsh, um, but I, I, somebody else puts it um, similarly. Um, George McGovern said in, um, it, it was around the 1972 election, uh, but he said, you know, the highest patriotism is not a blind acceptance of official policy, but a love of one's country um, strong enough to call her to a higher plane. Um, and I think that's what Baldwin is up to. I mean, Baldwin loves America. Baldwin loves the United States. Um, Baldwin believes in the vision. Um, but he, I, I mean, he is, he's simply, he's simply being clear and upfront about um, who has been excluded from that vision um, and who has been excluded um, from the founding promises. So. Do you all already, uh, Raymond, did you want to say something? Sorry. I was going to say, do you, do you already know who officially won the debate in the, in the Cambridge Student Union? They did, yeah, they did vote. This is just a small uh, observation, I suppose. So if you replace some of the particular examples that were mentioned by uh, Buckley and Baldwin with contemporary ones, you could have the same debate and it would be identical, the arguments would be the same. I find that very striking. Uh, there's, there's something important about that, I think, and I'm not sure uh, what I want to say about that. But it felt extremely um, contemporary, even though there were references to Selma and so on. You know, the, the thing that occurred to me watching this, and this is kind of maybe a, just an extraneous point, is just that how how many people were there, and you know, w the the things the students were, you know, they sort of this very proper sort of attire, sort of smart attire, but how articulate they were, how sort of the, how they got up in front of all their peers and were trying to you know make opening statements, arguments. Um, and how civil it was too, you know, it, it, uh, with so many people, how civil, it didn't break down, it didn't, you know, there's some shouting every once in a while, but, um, and it seems like, 
I don't, I don't know the history of these debating clubs in British universities. Um, I think there must be a, a history there, but that, but that, I, I think this is like organized just by the students. I don't think that this is like a, a club that you would join that would be moderated by a faculty member. I think they just did this of their own free. This is this is a a student led enterprise. Uh, that they were all interested in. They had a lot of people in their debating club. They invited these two famous Americans to come <laughs> and debate. And so there's a, there's a lot of student energy in just having a debate. Um, so maybe the difference there between sort of this this real, the presence that this debate has among these students and and now, you know, it seems like a big, like a big difference. <laughs> uh, just two things. Yeah, I mean, when you see that, you think, at least I think, that's what college ought to be about, those kinds of uh, raucous. And, and we didn't, this was edited, so we didn't quite get to see the heckling. We got a little of the heckling of, of Buckley, that's sort of the British way, um, but it was respectful. I wish we could have seen some of the the aftermath of of that. But the uh, just just to say, I'm referring to the late Baldwin. Uh, if you want, if you want to see the kind of thing I was referring to about uh, liberal ideals, uh, there's a documentary, uh, um, "Not Your Negro." I'm not your Negro, I believe. That's what I'm. That's what I'm referring to. So I'm not just making it up with Baldwin. Uh, he gets pretty radicalized. He's very disappointed, uh, you know, by the end of his life, and that—that's what I'm referring to. Uh, last, last comment right here. Yeah, I just want to offer a note about the context and the format of the debate. Um, the Oxford and Cambridge unions are—they are student. Um, they're student associations. Um, the thing with them, like I, I love this format. I love debate. I love um, civil debate. I, I, I think it's great. However, um, the conditions of this debate and the, the context that they're in, um, you're talking about a, a group of people who are, generally speaking, very wealthy. It costs a pretty penny to join these unions. Um, you're talking about um, a very racially homogeneous uh, group. You're talking about, um, you know, no small number of people in that room can trace their lineage directly to uh, the Norman nobles who came over in 1066. Um, I mean, my point here is that, you know, yes, this format is great. This is a great debate. This is a great civil debate. Um, but is that translatable? Is that transferable? Um, you know, what, what does debate look like in a more multi-ethnic, in um, a more multi-class um, in a more diverse um, setting where not everybody, I, I just, I, I would caution, um, I, I think this is great, but I, I would caution against romanticizing it. Um, and I would caution against um, thinking that, I would caution against comparing um, this debate society to society at large. Okay, I actually wrote about this in my notes when Buckley stated the presence of Baldwin actually like shows progression. And, you know, I was actually analyzing the crowd and there's barely, I probably saw two including Baldwin himself, black people. So who can probably understand that other black person, we don't know if they're from England descent, if they're American or what. Um, but another, um, thing I noticed was that there was more women in the crowd than there were actually black people. And I know in this time period, around this time period, probably 10 years prior in America, that's when like white suburbia was made where um, housewives were like a big thing. It was kind of reflected in England, I believe, but not as to the extent of um, America. So it's just like, yeah, just adding on to that point, like the crowd is just like, it really defines like what, well, it, and like, It could just be that's 
the British problem, and America is a racial and gender utopia, though. <laughs> um, yeah. So listen, right next door in the great room, there's uh, you know finger foods and cookies and all that sort of thing. Um, thank you for coming out. I hope you absorbed it, gave you food for thought. Um, look forward to continuing the conversation with you.